Well, um, I would like to uh, kind of do the classic thing and let's thank uh, in particular Dina and Marie and Jill for inviting me to this to this situation here. I, I'm going to be very old-fashioned after Simon, uh, and I'm I'm I have to admit that I was actually quite um, taken back by the title of the conference, and when I read all the different, the four different weeks and the different people who were going to be talking in them, I didn't really know why I had been asked to talk about processing knowledge production. And it was only in reading through the, the notes that were sent to us about this week, that I, or more generally, that I realized that actually uh, you, you're not really expecting any conclusion or any kind of uh, academic, if you like, in quotes, academic overview of the use of the term knowledge production because I can't do it. I, I, I don't work like that, and um, I, I guess in that sense I'm, I'm quite old-fashioned. So, as a curator, I, I was educated at the time when artists made work for other artists, and so I became a curator to make artists know what other artists are doing. And I work in that rather narrow way, uh, which means that I produce something called metronome, which is actually not commercial, even though we try and sell it from time to time. But I brought some here. Anyhow, I'm going to go into it, and then I can add it. So um, the kind, yeah, the kind of knowledge production that I want to discuss here is not one that is easily aimed at a large audience, nor is it the kind of knowledge that is validated by mass appeal and is readily available through wide-scale distribution. The knowledge that concerns me and that forms a central part of my work in art as a researcher, curator and a publish publisher is initiate. initiate. By that I mean that it is accessible only unto a few, that it takes time to find out where it lies and who holds the key to it, that it is encoded in such a way as to prevent easy reading, and that it contradicts or aggravates the production and consumption of art practice as part of a cultural and educational industry, be this through the standardization of certain theoretical tendencies, concepts of artistic research, or frameworks for artistic visibility. This area of knowledge production is problematic. It's problematic because it defies accountability, or rather, it is accountable only to the people who are fluent in the languages and methods that characterize it. In this sense, I think I would like to suggest that we're looking at producers of knowledge over and above the abstract discourse of the production of knowledge, people who are articulating a dialect or translating between dialects. And I forgot to add that this, um, this presentation to you has a <laughs> kind of a provocative title of privacy plus dialect equals capital. Privacy plus dialect equals capital. So I'd like to propose that there are interesting frictions taking place at the moment in the relationship between individual producers of a kind of knowledge that is private, sometimes even secret, and occasionally anonymous, and the parallel concurrent construction of common spaces or collectivities within which this currency of production can be evaluated, bartered for, and exchanged. And I want to refer to uh, recent metronome productions number 9 and number 10, but also to the work of the nuclear scientists at the Livermore Lab in the USA, the maverick polymath and ecologist Gregory Bateson, and certain cases that touch on anonymity and collectivity in art in particular, but I won't go deeply into it, Bernadette Corporation, and then the work of an Australian artist around something called neurocam.com. Um, I have organized a whole number of private meetings, meetings that look a little bit like this but are basically behind closed doors. And I did one recently in Tokyo uh, around questions of knowledge and tra the translation of knowledge and, and, and how we deal with the, the moving, the aspects of moving of knowledge. Um, and everybody who came to this think tank, so there were maybe 65 people, there were Nearly a half were from Japan, artists, professors, different types of characters from different places in Japan too, so not just Tokyo. Then there were um, people I'd worked with, because I come back to the people I'd worked with again and again, 
Uh, and so there were people from Belgium, there were people from Australia, from the States, from Oregon, um, from Europe, from Germany, whatever, and there were different generations in the room, and I asked everybody to provide four, one to four images that would illustrate, in a kind of classic way, a new faculty of knowledge, so that if we were planning an institution of some kind, let's say it was an art college in the best sense of the term, the most experimental layout you might have, then what, were the, what was the, the knowledge base that we would, how would we illustrate that knowledge base? So I'd like to show you these, um, I'd like to show you the result of this uh, exercise. And I'm not going to say anything, I'm just going to go through it. The titles of the faculties are below, but not the titles of the people who develop them. I'll warn you now, there are 140, but I, I won't, I'll do it quite fast. And you can tell me to stop if you want to, anybody. So. That's for you, Vincent. So you're getting people now who are not going into the faculties but the departments. Um, they had the choice to do whatever they wanted with this idea of the faculty.
To my surprise, no one proposed the notion of a faculty as that which is represented through a person or a group of people. The faculty of an individual who bears knowledge, has an ability, and by extension is a live repository of learning, someone that you can name there and then, and who can become a member of a group of faculty of faculties. Instead, it seemed that these Faculties of knowledge had to be sanitized, depersonalized, given long substantive titles, and made to appear as part of our popular mainstream understanding of images. Images gleaned either from art historical materials, including earlier interdisciplinary references, for example, to Patrick Geddes, um, to geology or material culture, or swiped from web banks, Googled through keywords, and abstracted into an area void of intersubjective responsibilities where even an institution today is able to survive. So I was actually quite shocked by the material that was sent. I found it highly paranoid in many ways. Um, and also by the titles that people proposed. And they were just given this brief. They, were not, they, were, they could interpret the word faculty as they wished to. Looking at ways of acquiring knowledge is another way of testing out just how far we are ready to conceive of knowledge production as a conception of methodologies based on subjective exercises that deliver new ways of seeing and understanding. Roger MacDonald, co-director of Arts Initiative Tokyo, uh, emphasizes knowledge acquisition rather than knowledge production, as central to the ability to translate, to move across borders, and hence to be flexible and open to semantic interpretation. He suggests that there are four main methodologies that help us to acquire knowledge and encourage the mobility of ideas and representations. The first is spiritual learning, right? So pilgrims, for example, an education that is interpersonal, perhaps not so very fast, and that involves the mobilization of the totality of an individual's experiential realm. The second learning is through mimicry and copying, a method well practiced in the Japanese context, he argues, which he claims, if used to control and repress, can also produce a subversive position. The third is through ingestion, drugs, for instance, that can confer both individual scope and offer the potentiality for users of a kind of coming together. MacDonald refers to raves as having been central to his personal production of knowledge as a student. Finally, he speaks of error and waste, the process of learning through mistakes, misfiring and failure as constituents of the articulation of thought. What appears as an old-fashioned set of categories where the teacher, guru, professor, or older artist informs the disciple or student of ways of learning and eventually producing knowledge, takes on a curious and somehow less anachronistic slant, if pitted against certain current perceptions of artistic research, in particular those linked to art college reforms. The discourse industry that Bach has mentioned in the introduction affects the foundations for the production of knowledge, and where better to begin, as Simon has also um, elaborated, than with art education in the art college. This location for knowledge production is similar to that of the university in its idealist construction. In other words, it should enable every person who is part of that institution to learn and produce and acquire knowledge, be they a first-year undergraduate, an older artist, a theoretician, or even an emeritus professor or should theoretically be engaged simultaneously in finding ways of producing knowledge without conditions, in the sense of Derrida's idea of the university without conditions. In developing methodologies and in exchanging thoughts around these. Um, strangely enough, what is curious is that if you take Michelangelo Pistoletto's University of Ideas, the one thing he doesn't do uh, in terms of the concept of the university is to encourage everybody on every level to be involved in a form of discovery, knowledge, you know, research, whatever you want to call it. Uh, as somebody who worked with him in, in Umide, um, I 
stopped in the end because I was being brought in as an expert for one week and then the next expert would come and the people who were there were different groups of artists from different parts of the world who would stay for three months but they were just being kind of serviced by, by people like us who were coming in for a short brief moment. If he had invited me and others to spend three months there, we probably would have developed things in parallel and it would have been more effective. That's my feeling anyhow. Um, However, this earlier vision of empathic learning that recognizes the agency of the teacher and the interdependency of levels of competence, as well as implicit, even tacit forms of transfer that require no formal validation, is no longer in favor. It has been literally ridiculed as a reflection of the old master-slave condition, criticized for the power relations it can yield, and you don't need to know how pathetic it is to have to defend German um, German art colleges against the UK system be on the basis that, you know, the criticism is that the old professorial system, um, you know, allows for the, for the exploitation of a power relationship between a professor and a student, etc., etc. Um, so, but primarily this kind of, of way of, the, of learning, if you like, uh, is made redundant on the basis of its unaccountability. The artist that never shows up, the reason Douglas Gordon was fired from Glasgow School of Art was that he just didn't show up, or that he didn't write a course. Um, the grey zone without clear outcomes and well-designated objectives. The need for proof that the knowledge learned will be applied and, if necessary, transferable. Knowledge production is something that you have to pay for, for which you may receive a diploma, a certificate or a degree that is valued at least all over the European Union to legally attend, and I stress the word legally because I think it is possible to illegally attend art college today, requires a vast symbolic investment on the part of the young student and an equally considerable financial commitment, certainly in the UK, more often to 99% debt base so that once you've left the college you're probably about 50,000 euros in debt. Research, a term only really exploited in the field of science since the first half of the 20th century, may be the buzzword in art circles, but in science it has always been tied to the institutional division of labor. If research produces no visible outcomes, then we have a crisis. As a result, the language of research in art needs to be standardized into prose, outlines, and reports, and in certain cases, bolstered with ideologies of sustainability or continuity. And this kind of idea, idea of sustainability is highly problematic because in many ways, yes, artists are, you know, pressing command N in order to get a new page, setting up new projects, it's, and then, you know, what happens afterwards? But ultimately, there's something highly problematic about that idea of, of sustainability. And it's, it is actually pushed, especially if you work with projects that take you to parts of the world um, outside of Europe or North America, where you are always being asked what the continuity will be when you leave. We all know that a PhD certificate will not make you an interesting artist, nor will it get you into the latest art context. What it can do is provide an expensive alibi for spending longer inside that particular environment which still defines the academy. Privacy, collegiality, and a heretic inclination towards certain forms of knowledge production. And the way I'm talking, you'd think I was speaking about a voluntary aesthetic penitentiary. I mean, it goes without, it, it happens to be a, a sort of detail on this that I did work in one in the Royal Army Medical College, which had been the largest European penitentiary in Europe um, in the 19th century and is located next to the old Tate. And this old building, which was erased in the end of the 19th century and then made into a Royal Army Medical College, has now become Chelsea College of Art. So I have worked inside, um, this is, I worked prior to Chelsea actually taking it over. I worked inside it. Um, anyhow, that's a sideline. I have actually worked inside college environments since 1998, and I have never formally taught a course. And in fact, all the work I do at the moment, in particular with Future Academy for the last four years, is totally unaccountable. They, they cannot uh, make, they cannot include it in the research assessment exercises of Edinburgh College of Art. And that's a kind of thing that they've done on purpose because they wanted to protect me from the bureaucracy and the politics of the Art Academy. On the other hand, now they're, they're kind of stuck because there isn't anybody else doing this kind of work which has got into certain places. So it's a fascinating and difficult moment to be in. I, 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 I'm paid as a consultant. 
uh, not as an employee, employee. As a consultant, I have a very, I mean, I can be fired tomorrow, or I can just won't work. Uh, at the same time, it gives me the freedom not, not to have my research used in academic circles, but only in, in, in the art world, so to speak, if you call it research in the art. I don't know anymore. Um, I've managed in art colleges in many or in different parts of the world pretty much to develop a specific context from which to produce and process my work under the guise of metronome and more recently Future Academy. None of this work, which I regard as curatorial work, uh, could have been done through the museum. The metronomes that have been produced in, in this way are perhaps an extended form of what Gregory Bateson has called a metalog. In other words, they encourage recursiveness knowledge looping back onto itself as a form of ecological epistemology. Bateson writes, a metalogue is a conversation about some problematic subject. This conversation should be such that not only do the participants discuss the problem, but the structure of the conversation as a whole is also revealed to the same subject. Only some of the conversations achieve this double format. Most issues of metronome attempt to produce a metalogical condition which explains why they all use different formats and are produced in different cities. And an obvious example, I guess probably the clearest one, is The Bastard, um, which is number seven, and was produced uh, in 2001 and involved an 18-month investigation into the use of the voice um, in art practice, undertaken in three Scandinavian countries and with the support of six art academies. However, this system of recursiveness is doomed to produce hermetic knowledge, Self-reflexive, definitely, but nevertheless knowledge that needs to be decoded with a formula that generated it or otherwise placed in proximity of other metalogues in order to incite a dynamic process of interaction and revelation. In many ways, we are actually talking about art and the production of knowledge, as well as germane areas such as those that can be found in complex forms of science or even religious practice. Two issues are important here for me. First, the issue of transmission and orality, which I want to develop now, and secondly, the nature of the human environment in which that transmission is produced. In his analysis of the Livermore Laboratory, the USA's second largest weapons lab, founded in 1952 for atomic and hydrogen bomb research and production, the anthropologist Hugh Gustafson presents a strange phenomenon of a quasi-medieval form of knowledge production and circulation. Unlike scientists in academia, whose incentive lies in winning recognition through stockpiling published articles, the scientists who enter Livermore are not under any pressure to publish. Instead, credit is established through face-to-face -face encounters, gossip, formal oral presentations, but never through written documents. And there is, thankfully, no academic journal that specializes in nuclear weapons research. The lab scientists' works belong to the state, it remains so private that they can't produce a curriculum vitae. It's a blank page. They have nothing to prove of anything that they've done. All that is left is their memory, and whatever inscription on the Earth's surface there, and this is where the jargon gets kind of interesting, where their events take place, and an event is a nuclear test. In one of the most ultra-modern environments in the world, we find that informal orality is the medium through which knowledge is produced and circulated. As Gustafson points out, ironically, nuclear, con nuclear contemporary weapons scientists worry that the high-tech oral culture they communicate through will die with them when they retire, when memory is lost, and that therefore substantial parts of their science too will die out. Here, weapon science has more in common with medieval craft apprenticeships than computerized scientific disciplines. As a result of that, there's now something called nuclear salvage theory and nuclear salvage theorists who compensate for this absence of authorship by producing mid-brow interpretations of individual contributions and often crediting you know, a, higher, a higher level in the hierarchy, a higher scientist than a lower scientist for having developed one particular experiment or one particular formula. Livermore is a community of highly advanced scientists. The knowledge economy it operates within is founded on the retention of the scientist's name and identity. Anonymity is so extreme that according to Gustafson, one scientist recounted how a colleague of his had won the prestigious Lawrence Award for his work, but that he was never able to find out what this person had done. When I asked 
Guy Biggins, the computational neuroscientist and PhD student who is also a coordinator of Future Academy in Edinburgh, what he made of this situation. He replied that Gustafson's argument, whilst relevant, had not responded to the problem, the key problem for him, which is incentive. That is to say, finding an alternative means of expression that fuels a scientist to produce an argument which he or she can trade with and thereby make audible to more than one fellow interlocutor. Binnings argues that the difficulty lies in finding out how to motor, how to have the incentive to motor towards a solution of a problem that is inevitably inscribed solely in a text-based discursive argument and therefore part of that environment of knowledge production for which the university provides the only framework today. To understand how to construct an alternative community of scientists and respondents whose knowledge production is not reliant on the circulation of an established and increasingly corporatist university discourse is one of the incentives that has brought Billings closer to Future Academy and by extension to art practice and which is why we are working now on the whole question of organs of research. Future Academy is an experimental mutating research collective which in its present form involves around 20 people, scientists, mathematicians, programmers, game specialists, artists, architects, and one music composer from Japan. They are from Iceland, Germany, Japan, the USA, and the UK. We meet twice a week. It's totally voluntary. It's bloody difficult to make a voluntary situation in an art college today because students are so used to paying for what they're, what they're getting that they, they have no time. They just say to you, I have no time. These are artists and they have no time. It's phenomenal, right? They're paying so much that they cannot get beyond what they're being taught as being the thing that they're there for. Yeah. So they have no time. Um, so we meet twice a week. No money is paid, no debts are formed. And as we begin to build a relationship, we also make work together. Currently, we're developing a new computer program that will enable a telephone lecture series to be constructed with input by telephone from all over the world, leading to a multilingual oral library. Working without the usual visual cartography of a website brings us closer to the navigation of a blind person and offers us the means to include forms of knowledge production through the voice, i.e. in an area of computing, and in an area of computing that remains prototypical and unresolved. Non-real-time audio is an alternative to text-based communication. So it's, it's, for me, it's very important that we can bring you know, somebody who could be in, in Burkina Faso, or could be in Bangalore, or could be in um, Utah, rings up and can say something and can do a lecture on the telephone uh, that is brought into a web situation and we don't know the, we don't need to know through, we, we have a series of accents and a series of languages uh, which can coexist but don't necessarily bring up questions of face or race or gender or age. This form of knowledge production presupposes a community of initiates, and I admit I feel of two minds about the frontiers between insider and outsider positions. But ultimately, I hold a preference for the artificiality of structures, such as laboratories, bureau, salon, lodges, think tanks, games, and dialects, right down to a fascination with forms of clothing that can trigger off the specificity of styles and communication. I realize how ambivalent this can appear. The neoliberal orthodoxy depends on the implementation of powerful mobile think tanks and lodges too. I am fascinated by the same kind of weapon that is used for resistance, secrecy, and espionage, and which acts as a base of knowledge production for intelligentsias that would not wish to be disclosed. In Dakar, I worked for many years, I still do, with a group of artists for whom the term communicational abstinence was the most appropriate to define the ways in which they handled dialogue with outside curators and historians to the degree that when one very well-known curator asked them for their archives, they could turn around and say to him, well, look, here's an archive, and give them a copy of Metronome, and then in the next instance say, well, sorry, but we had a fire. The fire burnt our archive. Uh, it's a huge risk to try and do that as an artist. In other words, not to respond to the timing and to the rhythm that an outside curator is, is placing on the table in front of you to say, no, you happen to be in Dakar, but hey, I'm busy right now. These are, these are for me, incredibly important ways of working. With metronome, circulation is restricted to those who know about it and the few who happen upon it. 
This predilection recently led to two productions of Metronome that contrast greatly in the ways in which they deal with concepts of anonymity and private knowledge, and that subsequently take on very different formats. Number nine could be described as a cryptic, under-the-table promotional review. Number ten, a pragmatic, under-the-ground survivalist scene. Okay, so um, a few more pictures. In 2004, the French critic Thomas Boutou and I began analyzing the work of the notorious Parisian Maurice Giraudias, who founded Olympia Press in the 1950s. Giraudias, the much maligned maverick of publishing, I mean, Jean-Jacques Prouvert calls him a complete drunk who was always, you know, writing his author's texts and, you know, I mean, no one, you mention Giraudias and people go, oh, oh, oh. so he's not French establishment. But he brought out the writings of William Burroughs, Vladimir Nabokov, Jean Genet, Alexander Trocchi, together with a whole stable of pornographers, I don't know what that's doing in there, but never mind. Um, uh, a whole stable of pornographers, not only by printing in English from Paris, but by doing so mostly under pseudonyms. So Alexander Trocchi had about four, depending on whether he was translating the Marquis de Sade, writing uh, his own pornography, writing something else. I mean, just uh, a whole series of them. Now, the reasons were concrete. Why did they, they adopt pseudonyms? McCarthyite censorship laws in the States and post-war vigilance and austerity not only bred a new genre of beat poetry and sexual, sexual revolutionary prose, the very stuff that Girodias published, but it also subjected it to ongoing interrogation and suppression. So clearly to publish in English from Paris was one way of uh, sending the Brigade Mondaine on a false path. Boutou and I, Thomas Boutou and I, wanted to understand, so here you've got, um, you can't actually see very much, but this is, a, uh, this is the inside of the strip teaser. Um, and I pinned them on the wall because I wanted to understand, I wanted to understand a couple of things. One was, who were these women and did they repeat themselves? In fact, you know, could you find, uh, where, what, what kind of images were they taken from? Or which ones did Giordias actually set up and photograph? And you know, you, you could read quite a lot into it. There's one particular woman, the one in the middle, who's leaning on a bed, looking up, who I'm convinced is a girlfriend of one of the writers, but I don't know, because obviously these are all anonymous women. And next to it, you have a series of extracts. So, Utu and I wanted to understand what would bring an artist or writer today, just over 50 years later, to withhold their name. Why? Which visual representations and forms and meanings and language, in short, knowledge production, would necessitate the retention of their identity today? And it was very difficult to, I mean, we still haven't really worked it out. The research took over one year. It was linked to our desire to develop a new context for production in Paris with a group of operators who would include, and in part do include, an architect, a sociologist, an iconographer, a writer, a filmmaker, and many artists. Boutou and I hoped to develop some sort of society analogous to Giordias's infamous troupe, his hotel, his club, which was doomed to bankruptcy, perhaps the only aspect we were less convinced by. The result is the establishment of Metronome Press in Paris and its Office for First Intentions, or Bureau des Premières Intentions, which we run in Belleville, and there are little brochures which tell you all about it. But for, before we established Metronome Press, we published a collection of fiction, and it's here, four books written by artists, mainly because I had the impression, and Thomas as well, that there was nothing more to read. If you think about it, you would walk into, I mean, I, I don't want to sound nostalgic or something, but in the early 80s, you walked into a bookshop in anywhere, in London, in Germany, in Austria, in, in Switzerland, anywhere, and there was a new Semian text, there was a new Merve there was something new that had been written by one of these people who have formed what is the kind of the theories that we're still working with. Now, what do you find? Every week, Routledge brings out a new reader in cultural studies, a new reader in post-colonial theory, a new amalgamation of the writers that were producing material fresh um, 20 years ago. So the question is, what do we read as art, art producers? What, well, what is it we're reading? And we got very interested in fiction because um, also because of the way that work, work is being produced using, if you like, we're interested in film scripts and scenarios in situations where people can adopt other persona. And 
not in catalogues, not in monographs, not in magazines, not in readers, and trying to work out, is it possible at the moment for artists to write fiction? So, um, in side number nine, which is here, these are all, all versions of the teaser. You're welcome to have anything that's on the table except the things that belong to the back. That's how it gets, so you take what you like. Um, we felt that short extracts, like the extracts that you can see there, short types of writing had to move also away from the notion of the review and become a little bit more like ideational jelly light, diffused by image sequences that recast the pages of, stri of the strip teases including in, included in Jiwa Dias's original pamphlet. Now significantly, over one third of the contributors in Metronome Number no. Nine opt to write under pseudonym, and I'm talking about quite well-known artists uh, whose names don't appear, but Nancy Strasberg appears, or Susanna Mabit, Susanna Mabit, obviously. Um, who else? Uh, Mark Atlas, um, the Reverend Boyd McDonald, a whole number of people who turn up, and. The issue is not about the vanity of the nom de plume here. Yeah. It's about enabling the producer to construct tangential forms of knowledge, even unto themselves, and in relation to their own, in some ways quite orthodox, construction of identity. The darker side to this maneuver is apparent in one or two of the six teasers that together build metronome number nine. But ultimately, the danger invoked in the process is closer to a transgression of one's own security system and identity as an artist than it is to questions of prurience and public disapproval. So just very quickly, um, these are kind of working shots. And this was the this is really what constituted the whole of this process in Paris was, was the kind of situation of meeting in my studio and working. Okay, and this is uh, actually not under pseudonym, so this is an infrared film that was produced by the filmmaker Philippe Grandrieux who some of you might know, uh, and it was a new film that he made for Metronome, and these are kind of shots taken from it. And now to something completely different. So, but the latest issue of Metronome produced in Oregon in 2006 and co-edited with the American artist Oscar Tuazon could not be more diametrically opposed in terms of visual imagery, format, and content. Here we have a survivalist scene to recast to transmit the results of four years of future academy activities. Now, I guess basically this little thing here, which is a quarter of a PhD thesis, 25,000 words, is a way of putting across four years of work in Senegal, in Bangalore, Bombay, Edinburgh, Braunschweig, uh, wherever future academy has operated. And it was very interesting to take a survivalist scene that has been made by a couple under the pseudonym of Burton Holly Davis, who live in the woods of Oregon, who live unhouse, it's called unhouse, um, and who produced this scene for a community of 1,500 people. We wrote to them, Oscar wrote to them, uh, they wrote back and said that they wouldn't be able to meet us if we went out to Oregon to find them, that they were happy with us using the model of dwelling portably, but that they would be far off in the woods and that we wouldn't find them. So we went out looking for them. Um, we, four of us, went out from Future Academy. Uh, okay, so this is this is dwelling portably from 1996, and it teaches you how to simple dwelling is comfortable in most weather. The Hill Lodge, wonderful name for a hole in the ground, is designed for portable living year around on steep slopes. Okay. So this was a plan of how to build a hill lodge. And this is basically what dwelling portably looks like. So we went to, you can see it's a formerly message post um, from Philomath in Oregon. And we drove out to Oregon. We, we hired an RV. This was the weather. It's not March of this year. Um, and we did over 2,000 uh, 2, miles of logging roads to look for them. This is a couple who have been working and living for 30 years in the woods. They produce two to four issues of Dwelling Portably a year. They send them out to a community, as I said, of 1,500 readers through a convoluted postage operation that requires accessing 
file about post office boxes at night, and archiving materials in dugout stores in various parts of the countryside. So they literally dig holes and bury uh, the, the books. And then they know. So when I sent the metronome, they were terribly upset because <laughs> they didn't know what to do with them, right? They don't carry, they live and carry everything on them. And they're not punks, they're not criminals, they're just people who don't want to live with a house or a boat. Now, keen for Metronome Press to publish the entire volume of DPs since the early 1970s, Oscar Tuazon is still trying to track down Burton and Holly Davis to secure their agreement. They do exist, they're not some ironic joke created by a coked out Hollywood producer. Only their secrecy is part of their survival and the foundation of their knowledge production, a dialect spoken by a group that remains covert. Disclosing their identity is an act that potentially places their work and therefore their capital in jeopardy. Until they make contact, the secret surrounding their activity and their production remains undisclosed. And I just want to show you what we did basically. This is, it was kind of hellish. We spent two weeks looking for them um, and the four of us living in this in this thing, which at this point is pretty disgusting. You can, if you see, look a little bit in detail, you can tell. Uh, we bought typewriters. The dwelling port of the is typewritten. Type um, it's totally strange to do a typewritten book these days, uh, cut and paste and whatever, especially with 25,000 words. So, you know, we had the material on the computer, but effectively we had to type it out. Um, but in order also, this is the early morning, this is Oscar Tours on, and Guy Billings on the left, the neuroscientist. This is cooking breakfast. It was very, very cold. I don't need to tell you how cold it was. And these are these, they're so stupid, they're built like tiny houses. They could be incredible, you know, I mean, you just strip them out and you make them into a moving studio, but they're, they're literally built to look like nasty little middle-class houses. Okay, now, I, you can't read this, but this is, Okay, so at this point, uh, not finding Burton and Holly, we decided to test out their theory and we dug a hole and slept in it, uh, a hill lodge. So this is what's going on, on a very steep slope. Um, but what's interesting here is that it says, tips for increasing privacy and security in the wilderness. This is from Dwelling Portably. Before choosing a campsite, walk around it from different angles and at different distances. The harder your camp is to approach, the less likely someone will find it. Climb hills, climb trees, scan the area. Consider visibility from the air. Don't camp in favorable hunting and fishing areas. Never create paths or leave trails near your camp. Approach your camp from various directions, not the same way each time. Don't let your wandering become routine. Stay aware of where you are, and that way you are heading. Sorry, be careful not to break limbs, turn over stones, or drop anything. Bonkers. All right, so this was a hill lodge we slept on, on palm leaves. Um, and we got completely high. I don't know what happened, but we drank two bottles of whiskey overnight. Um, it poured with rain. This was the result of the situation. And once we'd finished that, we knew we, we, had to, we had to start making metronome. We ran out of money. Uh, four people in an RV drinking whiskey and eating cost a lot of money. So the entire production budget had gone. Uh, we gave a talk at Portland State University, and the next day we had money to print, which was just, I don't know how else we would have done it. So we went to cyber cafes. That's a cyber cafe in Portland. And we set up our typewriters. Um, and we typed out DP, I mean metronome. This is the, the zine library of uh, Reed College that, that supported what we were doing. And this is um, Jasper Scrappers Morrison, who produces this zine, Stay Wild, Old Growth. So we were in the right area, you know, if we'd gone to like the East Coast, it wouldn't have worked at all. And this was the, the presentation at Piker. Portland Institute of Contemporary Art. Yeah, and this is the result. So these are just pages from, from Metronome. Okay, so I'm nearly finished. 
In a recent article in the magazine after all, Ben Relia, I don't know how to pronounce his name, speaks of the re-emergence of collectives and fictive identities in art and argues that these multiple and pseudonymic positions cannot be considered oppositional. His argument centers on networks and the lounge culture of project rooms and Kunstvereine, the kind of discourse industry we've been referring to earlier. Whilst this isn't quite in sync with the arguments I'm putting forth, I found it remarkable how he could dismiss pseudonyms as a fad, no different from the multiple vocations and opportunist structures proposed by the labor market of the new economy. And obviously, it's clear that Bernadette Corporation and the sideline Rena Spallings also featured in the same issue of After All, play both with these two questions that I've been trying to put across probably quite badly but because I'm unresolved as to how to deal with it. But the question of, on the one hand, anonymity and the construction of a collective way of working. Bernadette Van Hyatt, one of the founder members, describes the effects of Bernadette Corporation as follows. Communal subjectivity is a condition where each individual subjectivity is marked and altered by others and therefore not something that can be demarcated and identified. So if you remember the book that they did, where they claim 150 people wrote it, that's exactly what she's talking about. A very different example um, I came across in Melbourne this year was is a case of an anonymous collective which is, it has been initiated by an Australian artist in Melbourne who exhibited and who, whose name I can't di disclose, but is well known for doing his work and showing in galleries. And it's called neurocam.com. Has anybody come across it? No? Well, you can look it up, neurocam.com. Um, two years ago, a billboard in Melbourne was posted with the slogan, Get out of your mind, neurocam.com, inciting people to sign up to the site. Since then, in two years, membership has increased considerably, with numbers nearing over 20,000 people. When I met this man in a cafe, I had been told about him because I was interested in the kind of stuff that was going on, that was a complex in Melbourne. And one of the things that an artist told me about was that there was this guy in this group who were producing paranoia. And that uh, it was hard to reach him, but basically everything they did was about generating paranoia. So I tried to find him, and I found him, and he was very mild and very uh, tired. Each of the subscribers to neurocam.com undergoes intrusive background checks, may not reveal their true identity, and is told to take part in assignments, which can vary from training exercises, passing on documents, soft forms of spying, or, quite brutally, being abducted and taken to unknown locations. The neurocam.com site includes a lengthy disclaimer suggesting that it is neither a product nor a service, a dating agency, a cult, a religion, a game, a study, a terrorist training organization, a new type of camera, or any other thing or activity from the wide realm of possibilities. The only omission to this disclaimer, if you know how to find it, and if you're aware of it, is that Neurocam is not an art project. Concerned now, he is now concerned with the operatives who are the who are doing these assignments. What is big concern is now that the operatives want to fund the assignments and feel that they are part of something bigger. Right? So it's become incredibly complex and he can't handle it. And what he's trying to do now is return this unmanageable situation into the, back into the art world context. And that's why he wanted to work with me. So he wanted Art Angel to literally help him to re, re kind of direct this crazy, huge, mass collective of people who want to be part of a collective organization that they don't know anything about, but are ready to invest something in, back into the art world. The question of knowledge production, when combined with notions of communal practice and identity, especially anonymity, is bound to lead to a series of quite different formulations, and which obviously collectivities which deal in different ways with questions of instability. Here I've focused on the position of the producer of knowledge, trying as far as possible to intersect different backgrounds from science to alternative living and art in order to emphasize those modes of thinking and investigation which do require covert environments and which process knowledge through the implementation of methods and platforms that remain blurred to outside perception. As night is today, these conditions do not preclude circulation. 
When they do travel, it is sometimes without context, and as such, they have the ability to encourage the extravagance of heterodoxical signification. I believe that today the most extreme aspect of this is located in orality, the speaking of knowledge from one person to another, and if taken further, the use of memorization for subsequent transmission. And it is, for me, again, e really interesting that when I did Future Academy in Dakar, the cell kept coming back to the fact that if they were to set up a new kind of institution, then the old drawing class would be a class of memorization. And it's clear that if you have, if you've grown up with six or seven years in a Quranic school, you are trained to remember things. Um, it's not just remembering anything, but it's just the exercise of memorization, which we have in such a pathetic capacity right now that we don't even, we can't even remember what this. We won't even remember what people look like tomorrow and be able to reconstitute the room. So this is a problem, I think, in many ways. The polymathic ability to translate and operate across borders of cultures, languages and disciplines can ultimately produce more effective conditions for knowledge production without necessarily negating the desire for privacy and dialect. For art institutions, the inclination towards theory and intellectual discourse need not be transformed in any extreme sense, so even back needn't worry about re-signifying its fascination with intellectual theory and discourse say in your, in your introduction, because we should always support spaces that encourage reflection and discussion between people. I think, though, that it might be helpful to simply begin to share those scenarios and activities that tempt representations out of that which is not yet known, and as the Metalogue so neatly proposes, build new forms of knowledge production that run against the standardization of subject matter, language, and conventions of authorship.